Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, host of the Better Off Podcast. On this episode, we need to talk college with Beth Kobliner. It doesn't have to be a dreary thing. You could say to kids, look, we're in this together. We're going to figure out a great school for you that you can get into and we can afford as a family. Welcome to the Better Off Podcast. We are sponsored by Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. Now, we always talk about that this is the show that provides unconventional and entertaining insights on your money and your life. And where does your money and your life collide more than when you talk about college? And this could be college for yourself or for your children or your grandchildren. And here we are. It's the month of October. This is the month when the FAFSA form is available as of October 1st online. It's really important that you talk to your kids about college and paying for college And that is why we have an amazing guest. She is a return guest. Her name is Beth Kobliner. Beth is a journalist and an author. She wrote the New York Times bestseller, Get a Financial Life. She followed up with a great book called Make Your Kid a Money Genius, even if you're not. And now she's got a new part of her world, which I think is so important. It is called We Need to Talk College. Beth is rolling out this new part of her website about how early you need to start the conversation, how you shop for schools, how you pay for college, how you make the final choice. And we are just so happy that she's here right now. So here's our interview with recidivist better off guest, Beth Kobliner. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Beth Kobliner, you are back on the program and this time with a very exciting new part of your whole personal finance empire. Tell us about We Need to Talk College. You know, I've been on the road a lot this year um, promoting my book, and I realized the number one question parents are asking me is, how do we afford college? It's crazy. The debt loads are crazy. So at first, I wanted to look at the research, and research shows college is a great investment. If you graduate from college, you're going to earn, on average, a million dollars more than if you just graduate from high school. You'll have a net worth of four times more. So Mm -hmm. going to college does pay off, but you have to pick the right school and pay for it in the right way. And that's what this whole thing is. It's, you know, how to start the conversation, shop for the right school, figure out how much you're going to pay and make a smart college choice. So when should you start talking to your kids about college? Right. Well, as early as possible. And like, why be that way? As early as possible. Like, right. If your kid is in kindergarten, you're going to start talking about it? Actually, yes. What? In the way that you can say, you know, people who go to college are earning more money, people who go, oh, you want to be a teacher one day? Well, you have to go to college. Oh, you want to be an architect to build houses? You have to go to college. Just putting that in their mind. Mm. And also, we know from research that parents who tell their kids they're saving up money for college are more likely to go to college, regardless of how much money they've actually saved. Yes, we've saved three shekels. Good luck. <laughs> You're going to community college. Right. But, but at least they're, they feel like there's the expectation that they have to go. Okay. Now, what about when do you start having the conversation right. around, like, I guess, high school? Right. No. Actually, you want to start at the end of eighth grade. End, end of, of eighth grade. School. Okay. So what happens? What am I going to say at the end of eighth right. grade? Well, first of all, it's a series of talks. It's not just a one-off. Darn thing. it. Right. I know. It's much easier to do one-off. So you could do basic things. Talk about how grades start to count toward college in ninth grade. So start managing those expectations of your kid doing well so they'll get into a better school that maybe will give them more aid um, or more scholarships. Um, And also the big thing is managing their expectations about what you can afford. Mm. You know, I know so many, I bet you do too, grownups who said, you know, I got into my dream school and then my parents told me that they can't afford it, like after the whole thing senior year. So it's important to manage those expectations. And like any, you know, tough conversation, you want to talk to your kid. uh, Don't force it because they'll ignore you, but they'll start hearing it. They'll start hearing. And, you know, the basic thing is, you know, do you want a million dollars? Because if you do, you have to go to college. So you can kind of start that when your kids are in eighth grade to begin. The other part is, and probably the harder part, is having a heart-to-heart conversation with your partner Mm. and deciding, first of all, how much you can afford 
and how much you're willing to pay. Because people are, you know, shocked and it can be very tricky when one of you says, oh, let's, you know, blow our whole 401k savings on our kids dream school and the other's like mm, how about not a, so much right not so much how about a state school mm-hmm. and those are the conversations I think parents have to have before they talk to their kid so Beth in that research where you say you know on average over the course of your working life you'll have an extra million dollars a college degree is important right how important is where you go for example right Obviously, if you get into a really great elite school, yes. first of all, chances are if you make less than two hundred fifty grand or two hundred right. grand, you're probably going to be able to get a lot of financial yeah, or aid least or get, financial get a bunch aid. of it. Right? Two thirds of people get financial aid, but there's also a next tier right. or a few tiers right. down where it's expensive, <laughs> but it's not an elite school. So right. they a don't have an endowment, and b your kid's going to graduate, and like who cares if you went to whatever school? Right, right. I know exactly. And and we used to call that back in the old days at Money Magazine the Chivas Regal effect. Oh, yes. The idea that you know I don't know if you remember from the '90s, Chivas Regal was like fancy bottle, fancy name, but it, it kind of was like all the same basically. Mm. And the idea that the some schools that are kind of the second tier, third tier schools that are trying to seem as great as the really top, top, top private schools are charging as much as the top, top, top private schools to sort of put themselves in the same category, on the same lists. Mm-hmm. But actually, that's why it's so important for parents to talk and figure out what they can afford and what's that tipping point, you know. And also, I mean, there's something called a net price calculator, yeah. just nuts and bolts. A few schools, you know, you go on a few schools net price calculators and that will help you estimate what your family will be expected to pay. By doing that, you'll at least get you'll get a rough sense, you know, if a school costs, you know, sixty thousand dollars, how much aid will you likely get roughly? It could be a few thousand dollars off. And then is it worth it for you? And I feel like that's really where the hard conversations need to happen up front and sooner. How early should you and your kids start shopping for college? Right. I would say, again, the sort of financial shopping and the kind of nuts and bolts starts at the end of eighth grade, beginning as ninth grade as parents. And then you start narrowing down a bit. I'm not a big fan of the college tour. I got to be honest. Because you, you know, you people... loved your college tour, though. <laughs> I bet you did. Did you go on a college tour? Yeah, but they all look the same, you mm-hmm. know. And it's like, I do feel very um, much that kids are going, you go on college tour if it's a sunny day. Yes. And there's a cute boy or cute girl giving the tour. You're like, I love this school. But I think that. You know, parents have to guide kids. And I know so many people whose kids are from New York City, for example, they've never set foot on a piece of grass and they're like, I want a football team. You have to (laughs) you have to really kind of figure out what's important, what your kid is interested in. You have to sort of be open minded. And also your kid might enter school wanting to be a marine biologist, but they end up being a computer scientist. How about some of the programs like we so we both went to Brown. We didn't yeah. know each other in college, but we became no, fast friends. I think after. I knew you. You were cooler than I was. Stop it, I so wasn't. When you have a program like Brown has a medical program. Right. And let's say that your kid really does know, like, Mm. I swear Mm -hmm. I know. Right. Okay. Are you a fan of those kinds of programs? Or do you think, yeah, seven and eight year programs? Or do you think that that's a little bit too soon to make the choice? And that's a big commitment. It's a big commitment. I think often with those, probably it's particularly at Brown, I don't know the rules, but probably there's an escape hatch if Mm -hmm. you need it. Um, But I think that, you know, a lot of times parents say, look, go to the local college. For undergrad, figure out what you love, and then we'll help you maybe pay for grad school. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, my choice was, I don't know what your choice was. My choice was you get into, you know, Brown or Yale, or you go to Queens College, which was the local, you know. that was. I love that those are like your big three. Yeah, those are my big three. Because my parents are like, Queens College is basically free. It's an amazing school. But if you get into Brown or Yale, we'll, like, stretch for it. So Mm -hmm. I didn't get into Yale, but I got into Brown. But your kids did. (laughs) My kids did, yeah. (laughs) And I walk around Yale to all their friends, I didn't get in. I didn't get in. And they're like, Mm, we don't. Yeah. But I feel that Brown, for me, ended up, I left with $10,000 in student loans, which was a big deal at that time, Mm -hmm. which is, it's actually roughly equivalent when you adjust for inflation to the $20,000 median debt that kids are graduating with today. And, you know, graduating with 20000 even 30000 in federal student loans is a big number, 
but it's it's manageable. manageable. It's yeah. manageable. And one great rule of thumb is you and Mark Kantowitz, a yeah. college expert, told me this. You want to basically shoot for the amount of debt. Don't have any more debt than your first year income. So if you think your job at right out of school will be thirty thousand, don't You're take on more than right. thirty thousand. So. I think that people shouldn't be terrified of federal student loans. It starts getting crazy when you're looking at private student loans. Right, because they'll just give you money, right. whatever you need. And exactly. so you say, I'm going to blankety blank university sure. in upstate New York yeah. because it's like, oh, there's a cute lacrosse player or right. something. And you go there and then all of a sudden you come out and you got a hundred grand in debt. Exactly. That I a hundred percent agree with you. And I think that is the problem. And I think parent plus loans can really be devastating on a family, taking on, you know, we just last year, a federal report came out. We've just passed the point at which parent debt for paying for college is higher on average than student debt. So parents are actually borrowing $32,000 for the four years of college. Wow. Yeah. You know, parent plus loan, which is not even the worst of them. That That's, you know, it could, you can borrow a lot, but the interest rate is decent. Six, what's, seven now? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But what's really horrible are these private loans that parents could co-sign for their kids or parents take out themselves. And they should avoid that, in my opinion, basically at all costs. Right. No co-signing. Right. Remember that study which showed like the fastest growing segment was over the age of 60 for mm, student loans? Yes. That yeah. freaked me out. It's crazy. Because and, that's parents and grandparents. Right. And that's what we're talking about here. And I think there's, you know, I think there's a whole psychology. There's a like, guilt on the part of parents. Like, I want my kids to have maybe what I didn't have or maybe what I did have. You know, I want to make sure my kids get to go to private school. And private, as you point out, you know, it's like you you wouldn't just buy the most expensive suit if you walked into a store just because it's the most expensive suit. You know, you'd go, you'd want to shop around and see what matters to you. Right. You know, and the hard part about college, the thing that makes me crazy is if you walk into a store, at least you know what the suit will cost you. You buy a TV, you know, a car, you know. With college, people are flying blind. Mm. They have to fill out the application. Fill out that FAFSA form, the financial aid form that came out uh, the beginning of this month. Fill it out. Because first of all, if you make 150000 to it, you might get some aid and it's important. Or your kids might be able to take out some federal student loans. That's another thing. I know a lot of parents who say, oh, I don't want my kids to be saddled with any debt. Research shows that kids who kick into college costs, those kids have slightly higher GPAs than kids who don't pay anything Oh, I at love all. that. This is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. We'll get back to our interview with Beth Kobliner in just a minute. You know, I think that the average person out there, they kind of are reactive to the college planning process. But you know what? You're not average. That's why you're listening to this program, right? And you're not the average investor. So why settle for the same old average investing? Now there is a smarter way to manage your money. Betterment. Betterment is an online financial advisor for people who simply refuse to settle for average. They use cutting-edge technology to build personalized portfolios and help you make more from your investments. Then Betterment guides you along the way with advice to help you make smart financial decisions like, hey, how am I going to pay for college? All of this for one low transparent fee. Now, of course, all investing involves risk. Better Off Podcast listeners can get up to one year managed free by visiting Betterment.com slash Better Off. That's Betterment.com slash Better Off. And now back to our interview with Beth Kobliner. Friend of the pod, Kelly Peeler, who's got this great company called Next Gen Vest. And you gotta, mm. I'll hook you up with her. Mm. She is basically helping kids. She connects them with something called a money mentor. Mm. And it's usually a college student who will help kids complete the FAFSA forms great. and navigate the process of like money wise, what they can afford and what they can't. Mm. And she had a stat forever. I, I'm sure it's still there that there is two point seven billion dollars of unclaimed federal aid every year because people think I make too much to claim it. Right. Right. Fill out the FAFSA. I hear they got a new app. It's supposed to be good. Yeah, it's pretty good. You could also download the, your tax information. Mm -hmm. um, that's right on the finance. You know, right on that page. That will make it a lot easier for you to fill it out. Um, but there are there are a couple billion dollars that go unclaimed. 
um, this is mostly people who either don't think they'll be eligible or don't even know about it. And it really is a horrible shame. I think that it's important to, that we educate people so they know to fill out the form um, so that we don't leave all that money on the table. And the thing about the FAFSA, it just doesn't give you federal aid. It also unlocks the money state grants mm-hmm. and also college money. Yeah. And by the way, a lot of that state money is first come, first serve. Yes. So don't we wait until next year. Like, exactly. get busy. You got so many, like, highlighted red things. You live and breathe it. It's in your DNA. You don't need your notes. I know. You know, this is very personal to me because I found the, you know, spreadsheet that my dad did. Now, this is on graph paper spreadsheet. I love Where this. I was applying to colleges and he wrote down the cost of everything and what we'd have to pay. And I had to earn $2,000 a year in order to go to Brown. How did you do that? Working in the summers, working in the ratty, which Ugh. is the cafeteria. Also working short in- for the uh, <laughs> Sharp Refectory or the Rat Factory. <laughs> you worked in the ratty? That's the, the worst ratty. on-campus job ever. I loved No, I sort of signed people in. I oh, swiped okay. cards so I knew everyone's name. Oh, okay. That was fun. And then I worked in uh, BSA, Brown Student Services. and like My typical- friend checked IDs at the Athletic Center Ooh, at night and nobody was going going in there because oh. it wasn't like there was a fancy gym or anything no. at that time. And it's brown. And it's brown. Not right. so many alpha- Not- athletes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot as the former Except athlete. Except for you. Oh, yeah, whatever. Uh, but she said it was the best job because no one went into the athletic center at night. She just did her homework. She's right. like, they pay me to do my homework. Right, right. I had a bunch of jobs. I did catering there. I I actually worked even in a, a risk management office somewhere. Mm. You know, it was social and fun to work. You know, right. kids find that. And it's, most kids are working most during kids are college. Working. Right? Exactly. Yeah. I think, and we know not only is, you know, chipping into college helpful to kids for their grades, but kids who work in college who work fewer than 20 hours a week and have an on-campus job, those kids also do better on average than kids who don't work in college. Because I always feel bad. Like, you know, um, my friend uh, teaches actually at Queens College, and he was telling me that it's really hard that a lot of kids just to pay for certain expenses, they are basically working full-time and going to school at the same time, which is really hard. It's so hard. And that's where places like Queens College, I mean, the end of my story was I got into Brown, I took on some debt. It was great for me because I met people like you. I do remember meeting you in college. (laughs) It's okay. It's okay, Jill. But Mm. I also think that I would have gotten just as good an education or an excellent education at Queens College because the professors are amazing. And that was, you know, a trade-off my parents were willing to make and really worked and figured out how they can do that without putting themselves into debt. But again, I think in terms of education value, it's really important for parents to have these conversations with themselves and then with their kids. So the part that I think is important, and I keep talking to people about this and I talk to people you know, colleagues and friends and talk to people on the radio show is that I think that a lot of parents really underestimate the fact that they have their own networks for their kids and they don't have to pay up to be in a quote unquote network. And also you just mentioned graduate school. Like I find it really hard to, to like make the justification to spend all this money. Like let's say you'd have to borrow $70,000 and you really do think you're going to go to graduate school. Right. Don't it's, do it. No, it's crazy. Also, it doesn't have to be a dreary thing. You could say to kids, look, we're in this together. We're going to figure out a great school for you that you can get into and we can afford as a family. And by the way, if you go to Beth's website, and we'll link to it, BethColbliner.com, you can watch videos where Beth explains. So cute you look in this. I can't oh, even stand it. It's adorable. A fl- it's a flattering light. It's lovely. <laughs> um, then you can read about it because if some people are visual learners mm. and and you have stuff for kids right. also, which is so great. So there are... And sort of animations. Yeah. yeah. They, who did that? Is that you but shopping with your no. like page boy haircut? Yeah. Is that an old haircut <laughs> from 1970 no. something? It's, it's so interesting because I felt like this topic can be overwhelming and terrifying for yeah. people. And I'm like, well, how do we tell stories? So I met one family whose dad, he was an immigrant from Mexico, and the daughter was the first one in her family to go to college. And how did she navigate the process? Mm. Or a girl who decided, you know what, I'm from Florida, but I got to get out of here. I want to be in a different place. And how she navigated it. And her mom had been saving in a Florida plan. So how did they figure that out? And Mm -hmm. those kind of real stories are interesting but also important to realize it's an emotional thing. All these conversations are emotional, 
But first and foremost, as you and I both know, pretty much everything's economic and financial in the end. It's it's having that conversation. And that's why I called it We Need to Talk College, because I've been reaching out and I've been talking to so many different communities and organizations that feel, you know, this is a priority. How do we educate parents to make smart decisions? The other thing I just wanted to say is, you know, Alan Kruger of Princeton did a great study that found that he looked at incomes of kids who go to top, top, top prestigious schools. Now, these are the really prestigious ones versus not. So and- Yale versus Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. No, Yale, you know, versus not a prestigious, like right. Queens College, in the sense that although Queens College, again, is an amazing institution, and he found that middle upper income kids who went to a top Ivy League school versus a non Ivy League school, those kids didn't really earn more. You know, because like you said, their parents have connections and they didn't really benefit from those connections. Mm. It's the lower income kids that did benefit from going to those top name schools. So it sort of shows that what we perceive as value. And believe me, it's been nice to spend my life saying I went to Brown. Yeah. It's it's a nice little, okay, she's pretty smart. Yeah, but you know what everyone's thinking? You couldn't get into Yale. (laughs) (laughs) Which would be true. (laughs) And I tell them right away. No, I, I mean, Brown was perfect for me. I loved it. And it there it is wonderful to find a place, but there are many, many, many places. Mm. And I think just as much as I love Brown, I could never imagine going anywhere else. I think that if I landed somewhere else, if we're at Queens College, I would have enjoyed it. Maybe, you know, met Jerry Seinfeld or something. Now, yeah, you did really bad with your marriage. <laughs> um, I love this so much. I love all the work you do. If I go to BethKobliner.com, Am I just going to get taken to this? How, what, or Go to it... BethKobliner.com and you'll get right away to We Need to Talk College. And we will make a beautiful link. And Mark, let's put We Need to Talk College on our resource tab on the front door of Jill on Money so we have that. Cool. Right? Because awesome. Beth's a friend of the pod. He loves you. You mm, know that. I love Mark too. Who doesn't love Mark? I don't but know. But now you have a Julia. Yeah. You have a Julia and I have a Mark. I love Julia. Well, Beth Kobliner, as always, it is such a treat when you come in. You light up the room. Oh. It's so it's it's always so great to see you. So right thank back you for at you, Jill. Thank you for coming in today. My pleasure. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. <laughs> okay, it's time to focus on you. After our interview segment, we do talk to you and we have our listener question of the week. If you would like to join us. Maybe you want to talk about a work-related issue. Maybe you got a new job offer. Maybe you are thinking about taxes towards the end of the year, retirement planning, whatever it is. It's very easy to get in touch with us. Just send us an email. Ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com. That's what Chen did. She's calling from the Bay Area. Hello, Chen. Welcome to the show. What can I do for you? Hi, Jill. Um, I'm calling uh, to get some advice about um, how long my husband can take off work. So my husband currently works for me um, at a startup, and um, he would like to take about 6 to 12 months off. Um, We have quite a bit of savings um, in cash, and so I'm just trying to decide how we can figure out how much of that savings that we can eat into Uh um, and still be comfortable. And then also my second second part of that question is just thinking about if we need a financial advisor. We're really busy and so not great about um, always like investing and really thinking about, you know, where we should be putting our money. Got it. Okay. So let's let's uh, back up. How old are you guys? I am 35 and my husband is 37. Okay. And you have kids? Uh, Yes. We just had a baby. Oh, congratulations. Well done. (laughs) Thank you. And you're both, but you're both working full time right now. Yes, we are. And uh, how much do you earn together? Uh, 260K a year. And what do you figure you really need to kind of just float your lifestyle without even saving just to to make ends meet? What do you think you need to earn? Yeah, probably about $10,000 a month. Mm -hmm. You mean in expenses? Yep. And when you are um, looking at the 6 to 12 months, he is basically going to take it off or is he going to do something part time? Like how what would ideally Uh, he'd like to do? 
I think ideally he'd like to take that time completely off. Who says he gets to do that? You're the boss. <laughs> how do you? So let me ask you two questions. One, how do you feel about that as a spouse? How do you feel about that as the boss? Yeah, so as a spouse, um, you know, he's worked for my company for almost six years now. And so I feel like he's devoted a lot of time to my dream. Um, and I want him to be able to work. I mean, he's not going to completely not work. He's had some side projects, um, but most likely it won't bring in money right away. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that he should get to pursue his dream um, as a boss, uh, it's very hard to hire senior engineers in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so, so yeah, I'm probably more upset about it as a boss. How much money do you have socked away in the bank right now? Um, so we have $110,000 in cash. Mm -hmm. Based on just your income alone, if he takes off, what will you be earning? Uh, we will be earning $135,000 a year. Okay. So, that means we've got to come up with some extra money, right? So of your cash, here's what it mm -hmm. seems like you need. I would, okay, so let me just first start by saying, in your situation, what you might be thinking is, oh, you know what, while he's taking this time off, I don't want to put money into retirement. I don't right. want you to do that. I want you to keep putting money into retirement. You've got money in cash. It's fine. Okay, so we're going to use, we're going to burn up some of that cash. Do you have a 401k mm -hmm. plan for the uh, business? Yes, we do. Um, we haven't uh, started really contributing all that much to the 401k. I really haven't contributed to my 401k since I worked in finance, which was about six years ago. Hmm. Well, I guess now's not the exact best time to do that. Um, all right. And, and do you have any matching component that you're providing as an employer? No, no, we do okay. not. I got gotcha. you. Okay. And you own your home, right? Yes. So we're paying a mortgage right. on it. The way I look at it is this. You're going to make 135 grand. You're going to be able to pay not all of your bills, but a good chunk of them. So it seems to me that I don't think he can take 12 months off. I think he should take six months right. off. I think six okay. is the right number. You've got enough cash to kind of float you through. But in six months, mm -hmm. y you guys together have to be making that much money because, number one, you want to replenish your cash right? You need to replenish some yeah. of that money. And number two, in six months, you're no spring chickens anymore. You got to start putting money into retirement, but you don't have any leeway right now to do that. The right number to me is a six month sabbatical. Can I tell you what we have in our 401k yep. right now? Yes, you and can. Our, okay. So we have 320k from my finance days in mm -hmm. our 401k. Mm -hmm. We have 10k in an IRA and 50k in a Roth IRA. Mm -hmm. And then we have um, about $120,000 in Vanguard. So that's just a plain brokerage account. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's good. Uh, again, it's good. It's not great. You know, you've got huge potential. You own your own company. I presume you're doing this because you, you have a huge upside. I'm not worried mm -hmm. about the 401k, the IRA, the Roth IRA. We're going to leave those alone. But the brokerage okay. account, it's a non-retirement account. Presuming if he's like go, wants to go to the mat and say, I really want a year off, then you've got to liquidate that account and you got to put it in cash and spend it. Because okay. you're, so that's the, that's the trade-off. Either you say, okay, I, I got the cash on hand. You're going to probably end up spending five grand a month extra. You're going to need five grand a month, I think, to float yep. your lifestyle. And that has to come from someplace. So it could come from your cash account, in which case you would spend half of it, that five grand a month, spend it, be done. He goes back to work. You're no worse off, right? You, got, you spent some money, but he found himself. He found his passion, whatever he did. If he wants to take a year off, then you've got to liquidate the brokerage account. The reason is it, it probably would be fine not to. But if, God forbid, something weird went on in the world and the brokerage account was invested and the market went down and he's in the ninth mm -hmm. month of his sabbatical and, you know, the crap was hitting the fan and you couldn't take a salary anymore. There's too much, too many variables. You couldn't take a risk yeah. with that money. So you've got to yeah. put that money in cash, which sucks because you really do want to be invested. But to be cautious and smart, if he is going to take 12 months off, you're going to have to cycle through that brokerage account and use some of that money to be the cash cushion just in case the blank hits the fan. Got it. So you're saying that we should always have a certain amount. Um, I think you guys need to have a hundred grand in cash on hand. 
because you're in a high risk situation right now, right? You're, you're you own your own company, and until unless you say to me, we're not both employed by the high risk company. So essentially, if if you said, okay. He took this time off and you know what he decided? We don't want to work together anymore. We love each other. He helped me start this. He's going to go work for blankety blank blank and earn. Oh, yeah. He would go work for a different company. So if he's so if he comes back, right, if he were Mm -hmm. to come back into the workflow, right, and he goes into the employment landscape and, you know, oh, I'm going to go work at Kleiner Perkins and make 600 grand a year. Okay, well, then you don't need to keep that money in cash. But if both of you are in high risk fields slash companies, then I think you need to have your 10 grand a month, essentially a year of your expenses in the bank or a little less is what I would say. That's really what I would think. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about what about what about a financial advisor? What are we going to do for you? Um, Well, so we like I said, we haven't been really investing in our 401k. Um, We haven't really, you know, thought about. Uh, just, you know, uh, putting more in our Roth IRA or IRA and just like figuring all of that out. Mm -hmm. Um, We just, uh, because we're so busy, we just haven't done it. Okay. So how, Um, we need someone to kick your butt, right? A little bit? Okay. So um, what, there's two choices. One is, um, you know, you can use an online platform or you may want to go out and actually find yourself a financial advisor who will help you with this process, who will help you run some numbers. I think it would be worth your time and energy to maybe invest in a fee only financial planner, meaning somebody who just is going to I don't even think it's that hard for you guys. I think it's like you just need someone to be like, here's the deal. Here's what you need to do. Do these five things or I can do them for you. But This is what you need to do. It sounds to me like that's the situation you're in, right? Yep. And I can get you the name of somebody in the Bay Area because I actually know some people. I will be happy to do that for you. I think that you don't have to give someone your money to do that. You can get the advice and execute it. The question is, you know, if you don't feel like you're going to execute the plan once it's given to you, then you may want to hire someone to do that, too. Okay. No, that's really helpful. Um, in terms of what we should be putting into our retirement accounts, um, I, I guess, uh, I guess that you would say that we should be maxing out our four hundred one k. I guess you would be right. <laughs> okay. You're right. I mean, you look. I get it. You're building a business and you're young still. So I don't have a problem with that. And, you know, it's great that you have, uh, you know, almost four hundred or five hundred grand saved. It's yeah. just that, you know, you know that if you came from finance, you probably were in the habit of maxing out your retirement account. We'd love for you to get to that place again. Okay. Um, give me a, a day. I just got to track down this guy's contact information and um, I'll have Mark email you uh, it, the info of the guy. I, I'm pretty sure he's in the Bay Area. I want to make sure he's not in L.A., but I'm pretty sure I'm remembering he's Bay Area and he's a good guy okay. and he's super smart. So I think you'd like him and young like you. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's super helpful. All really right. I'll t- it. All right. Take care. Good luck to you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much to our guest, Beth Kobliner. Check out her new project on her website, bethkobliner.com. We'll have a link to it in our show notes. And thanks to our caller, Chen. Don't forget, we drop new episodes of Better Off every Tuesday and Thursday. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is the awesome executive producer. We're distributed by Cadence 13, and we're sponsored by Betterment. See you next week. See you next week.